So before we get into the main video, I just want to give some of you guys a warning because I could have gotten into some big trouble. After I posted the last video, I saw some comments asking me to be YouTube friends and saying we should collaborate. So naturally I was very excited. However, I wasn't really able to click on the comments and check out the channels that left them. Well, it turns out YouTube was trying to protect me because when I looked these guys up, I found out that they were scammers. Two comments for, from a channel named Eximer Tracks sub to me. Do not subscribe to this channel. It's a virus and the guy will hack you. Another was from a channel named Todd. Now, thankfully, this guy won't hack you, but it's still a scam channel where he just runs contests to see which small channel he will give a shout out to. And that comment was a bot. Still not cool. I've put links into the description to videos about these scams. I've reported both of them, and from now on my videos are going to be set to report comments that are likely to be spammed to me for approval. If I'm still having trouble with comment bots, I will set it so that all comments must be held for review. Just know that if you're not a bot, you probably have nothing to worry about, and I will approve the comments even if people I disagree with. The last thing I want to do is censor people. Anyway, on with the rest of the video. Hello, I am the Nerdy Apologist, and on this channel we use the tools of faith and reason to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is the fourth video in a series I am doing on Christian apologetics, so if you have not seen the previous videos, please check them out before continuing with this one. You should especially check out the video right before this one, as this video will not make any sense unless you have seen that one. In that video, I argued for the existence of an unmoved mover, something which is subsistent existence itself and is purely actual. Now, most classical theists throughout history have typically just applied the name of God to this thing at this point of the argument, and then argued for the divine attributes later. For example, at the end of his first way, Aquinas writes, quote, Therefore it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, put in motion by no other, and this everyone understands to be God, unquote. Many critics of this argument at this point will say, well, wait a minute, I don't understand this to be God. You haven't proven the unmoved mover to be omnipotent, omniscient, fu fully good, or any of the other classical divine attributes, completely ignoring the fact that Aquinas goes on to argue for those very things. Nevertheless, I will be taking the approach of Dr. Fazer in Five Proofs of the Existence of God, who does not apply the label of God until after proving the divine attributes. And that is what I will be doing in this video, proving the divine attributes. First, we can show that there can only be one purely actual being. In order for there to be more than one of a certain type of thing, there must be some way in which those two can be differentiated. For example, suppose I have two different pianos. There must then be some way to tell the difference between the two. Maybe one's cleaner than the other, maybe one's more in tune than the other. You'll always be able to tell the difference between them by their location. Notice that these all involve potentials being actualized. There is always a potential being actualized in one that is not being actualized in the other. So in order for there to be more than one of something would entail that that something has potentials that can be actualized. But pure actuality, by definition, has no such potentials. Therefore, there can only be one purely actual being. Also, because whatever is subsistent existence itself must be purely actual, there can only be one thing that is subsistent existence itself. If there is only one purely actual being, then that entails that everything else is not purely actual, meaning that everything else has some potentials that are being actualized. Likewise, the fact that there can be only one thing whose essence is its existence entails that everything else has an essence distinct from its existence. Recall from the last video that whatever has potentials that are being actualized and has an essence distinct from its existence must ultimately be caused by something which is purely actual. Hence, the purely actual being is the ultimate cause of the existence of everything other than itself, and that which ultimately actualizes all potentials. Notice that to have power is just to be able to actualize some potential. But as we just concluded, the purely actual being ultimately actualizes all potentials. Not only that, but the purely actual being must be able to actualize any potential that could, in principle, be actualized. For suppose that there were some potential that could be actualized, but not by the purely actual being, then it could only be actualized ultimately by something else. However, in the last video we proved that any potential that is being actualized must be actualized by the purely actual being. 
So this potential can only be actualized by the purely actual being and can only be actualized by something else, which is a contradiction. Thus, the purely actual being can actualize any potential that can be actualized. Since power is the ability to actualize some potential, to be able to actualize any possible potential entails having all power, but to have all power is what it means to be omnipotent. Therefore, the purely actual being is omnipotent. Some object to the concept of omnipotence because it seems to create contradictions. You've probably heard of the omnipotence paradox. Could God create a rock so heavy that he couldn't lift it? On the face of it, it seems to create a dilemma. If we say yes, then God can't lift the rock. But if we say no, then there's something that God can't create. Either way, there's something that God cannot do. The answer to this objection comes when we think of omnipotence in terms of actualizing potentials. Recall that I said that omnipotence is the ability to actualize any potential that can, in principle, be actualized. Now, this question is asking about creating something, or actualizing the potential of something to exist. In the last video, we established that something can only exist if it has a well-defined essence. However, a rock that somehow limits an omnipotent being's power is a contradiction in terms, and as such does not even have an essence. Therefore, the potential for it to exist cannot be actualized, not even in principle. In fact, it doesn't even make sense to call it a potential for this reason. So the question is basically asking, can God actualize the potential of something that does not even have an essence to exist, even though existence requires an essence, which is just nonsense? The answer then is clearly no, but this does not contradict the idea of omnipotence because the existence of a rock so heavy that God cannot lift it is not a potential at all. More generally, we can say that no contradiction is a potential that can be actualized, which would answer other questions like, could God create a married bachelor or a round square? Similarly, as we will later see, God is all good, which also means that he cannot do any evil acts such as lying. Again, these are not potentials at all, so it's no contradiction to say that God cannot actualize them. Another, more tongue-in-cheek response that I like is to say that, yes, God can create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it. But because we've already allowed for a contradiction, we can also say that God can go on and lift it. It really is true that from contradiction, anything follows. Another very trivial fact about the purely actual being is that it is immutable or unchangeable. This is really not that hard to prove. As was shown in the last video, to be able to change entails having some potential that can be actualized. But pure actuality, by definition, is completely devoid of potentiality. Thus, the purely actual being is immutable. We've already discussed the necessity of the purely actual being in the last video, but it's well worth going over again. The purely actual being has an essence that simply is its existence. That is, the purely actual being exists by its very nature. It cannot, therefore, fail to exist but this is exactly what it means to be necessary. Hence, the purely actual being is necessary. A corollary to the purely actual being's necessity is its eternality. For if the purely actual being began to exist at a certain point in time, then it would not be necessary, as there would have been some point in time when it did not exist. Likewise, if the purely actual being were to go out of existence at a point in time, it also would not be necessary. So the purely actual being exists now, has always existed, and always will exist, which is another way of saying that the purely actual being is eternal. The idea of its eternality goes far deeper than saying that it has always existed and always will exist, however. It is also to say that the purely actual being exists outside of time altogether, for to exist in time entails having potentials being actualized. For example, picture me on a specific day at 1 o'clock. Well, this means that the potential for me to exist at 1 o'clock is being actualized. Likewise, when the time changes to 101, it is the potential to exist at 101 that is being actualized, and so forth. But the purely actual being does not have any potentials to be actualized, so it cannot exist in time. It is therefore timeless. Likewise, the purely actual being cannot exist in space, because that too involves potentials being actualized namely the potential to exist at one specific location rather than another. It also entails the ability to change location in space, so the purely actual being is both spaceless and timeless. We can also prove that the purely actual being is immaterial, or not made of matter. This is because matter, by its very nature, is changeable, 
It can be molded into different forms and it can be moved from one location to another. Furthermore, the most fundamental building blocks of matter can pop into and out of existence, meaning that matter is not eternal. But the purely actual being is immutable and eternal, so it cannot be made out of matter. That is, the purely actual being is immaterial. So, we have proven that the purely actual being is one, the cause of everything other than itself, omnipotent, immutable, eternal, spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Before we prove anything else, there is one crucial fact about the purely actual being that we need to prove. It is absolutely simple, or non-composite. Recall from the last video that this is a key distinction between classical theism and theistic personalism. Consider that whatever is composed of parts has to have certain potentials actualized in order for it to exist. For example, a piano can't exist unless the potential of each of its parts to form a piano has been actualized. This is easy to understand when we're just talking about physical parts, but this principle goes much deeper, as a thing can have metaphysical parts as well. I know it can feel a bit strange and abstract to think of something having metaphysical parts, but hear me out. First consider that many essences have parts to them. The traditional definition of a human being, for example, is a rational animal. If we accept this definition, we can say that rationality and animality are parts of the essence of a human being. However, it doesn't make sense to say that these things are physical parts of a human essence, because a human's essence is itself non-physical. I mean, you can't just point to a physical object and say, this is the human essence. As such, rationality and animality are metaphysical parts of a human essence. There are numerous other examples of things having metaphysical parts. A sentence has words as parts, an argument has premises and a conclusion as parts, a sum has terms as parts, and so on. But even these things, which are composed of metaphysical parts, must have potentials actualized in order to exist. For example, a human being cannot exist unless the potential for rationality and animality to be combined in a thing is actualized. But the purely actual being, by definition, has no potentials that need to be actualized in order to exist. Thus, it cannot be composed of any parts whether physical or metaphysical. In other words, the purely actual being is absolutely simple. Now, if the purely actual being is absolutely simple, this entails that there is absolutely no distinction between any of its attributes. For if there were, then these attributes would constitute parts of it. However, it can be very strange to think about these divine attributes as not being distinct from each other. For example, we are about to prove that the purely actual being has intellect and will, attributes that seem very different from some of the ones we've just proven, such as omnipotence and eternality. In fact, they even seem different from simplicity itself. It might be objected, whenever we speak of a thing's intellect and its uniqueness, aren't we referring to two really distinct attributes of that thing? So how can you say that they're not distinct in the purely actual being? And there's the catch. If we meant that the purely actual being has these attributes in exactly the same sense that we do, this objection would be valid. But we don't mean that the purely actual being has these attributes in exactly the same sense that we do. Rather, we mean that it has these attributes in an analogous sense. And this brings us to another crucial fact about the purely actual being, and that is the analogical use of language. You may have noticed that oftentimes we use the same word to refer to two different objects. For example, I can say that I am a human being and that both of my parents are human beings. I can also say that a person is irrational and that a number is irrational. Or I could say that my dog has died and that my phone has died. In these three examples, I have demonstrated the three types of ways that a word can be used when referring to multiple things. In the first example, when I say that I and my parents are human beings, I am using the term human being in exactly the same sense. When I refer to myself as a human being, I mean nothing different than when I use the term to describe my parents. This is what philosophers call the univocal use of language, in which terms are used to mean exactly the same thing. In the second example, I use the term irrational in a completely different sense. When I refer to a person as irrational, I mean that they're not thinking clearly, or that there are flaws in their reasoning. On the other hand, when I refer to a number as irrational, I mean that it can't be written as a fraction. These two meanings are completely different, and it is only because of historical circumstances that they happen to be attached to the same word. 
This is what philosophers call the equivocal use of language, in which terms are used to mean completely different things. In the third example, I use the verb to die in a middle sense. When I say that my dog has died, I don't mean exactly the same thing when I say that my computer has died, but it's not completely different either. Rather, there is something that happened in my dog that is similar to what has happened in my computer, even if it's not exactly the same. This is what philosophers call the analogical use of language, which is a kind of middle ground between the univocal and equivocal uses. Notice that this use of language is not unique to philosophy or theology. Even technical fields such as physics are rife with examples of analogical language. My favorite example from quantum physics is spin. When quantum physicists speak of electrons as having spin, they don't mean that they're spinning in exactly the same sense that macroscopic objects spin around an axis. However, there is something analogous to macroscopic objects spinning, even if we can't fully comprehend what's really going on. Similarly, a core aspect of classical theism is that we can only speak of the purely actual being as having certain attributes in an analogous sense. This follows directly from its simplicity, as none of its attributes can be distinct. If we wish to restrain ourselves to the univocal sense, or using terms in exactly the same sense, then we can only say what the purely actual being is not. For example, it is not changing, not made of matter, not in space, not in time, etc. This is critical to keep in mind during the rest of the video. The idea of analogical language can also be used to respond to another objection, which is that the purely actual being cannot change without itself being changed. While this is certainly true of us, it does not have to be true of the purely actual being. When we say that the purely actual being actualizes some potential, we do not mean exactly the same thing as when we say that we actualize potentials, but only something similar. So now, let's demonstrate that the purely actual being has intelligence. Now what do we mean by intelligence? Well, let's think about it. Think of a triangle, for example. There's a very real sense in which we can say that the form of a triangle is within you. Not only is the form of a specific triangle within you, but the universal abstract form of triangularity is within you. For if your mind did not contain the universal form of triangularity, you would not be able to think of a triangle when being told to do so. However, you yourself are not an instantiation of a triangle. This is what Aristotle and Aquinas have meant by intelligence, to possess the universal form of something, abstracted away from all particular instances of it, without being an instantiation of that form. To see how this applies to the purely actual being, remember that the purely actual being is the ultimate cause of all things other than itself. This is very important because all effects must be in their causes in some way. This is called the principle of proportionate causality. Now, there are different ways in which an effect can be in its cause, but it has to be in its cause in some way. For if there was some part of an effect that didn't trace back entirely to its cause, then that part of the effect would be actualized without a cause, which we showed in the last video is impossible. For more information on the different ways that an effect can be in its cause, check out the description. So, the purely actual being is the ultimate cause of the existence of all possible things, and thus all possible things must be in the purely actual being in some way. But the existence of something, as we said in the last video, presupposes its essence, or its abstract form. As a result, the purely actual being must be the ultimate cause of the abstract forms of all possible things, which means that the abstract form of all possible things must exist in the purely actual being in some way. In other words, the purely actual being possesses all abstract forms. However, the purely actual being itself is not any of those forms. So the purely actual being possesses all abstract forms without being an instantiation of any of those forms. But this is just what it means to have intellect. So the purely actual being must have intellect. In other words, all possible things exist in the purely actual being in a way that is analogous to thoughts. There is a real sense in which we can say that the purely actual being knows the forms of all things. There is more that we can say about the purely actual being's knowledge. Consider, for example, that all states of affairs are grounded in the essences or forms of things. For example, the fact that periods of daylight tend to be warmer than periods of darkness is grounded in the essence of the sun, 
For whereas this fact is not part of what it means to be the sun, it is nevertheless the result of the sun's ability to make things warmer and its proximity to the earth. Because the purely actual being, being the ultimate cause of the sun, knows perfectly what the sun's essence is, and because the state of affairs of days on the earth being warmer than nights flows from the sun's essence, the purely actual being must know that days on earth are warmer than nights. This must also be true for all other possible states of affairs, including ones that are only possible but do not obtain in the real world. For example, even though we live in a world where Abraham Lincoln was not able to serve out two full terms as president, the purely actual being must know what would have happened if Lincoln had served two full terms, because this was grounded in his essence. To know all possible states of affairs, not just what is happening right now, but everything that has happened, will happen, could happen, or would happen, is just what it means to be omniscient. So the purely actual being is omniscient. It is important, again, to understand the analogical nature of the purely actual being's knowledge. The purely actual being does not know things in exactly the same way that we do. For one thing, our knowledge is heavily correlated with physical, biological processes happening within us. But we've already established that this can't be true of the purely actual being, who is wholly immaterial. Also, when we have thoughts, those thoughts occur within time and are an example of change within us, neither of which can be true of the purely actual being. The purely actual being also cannot learn anything, as that would require change and would mean that it is not omniscient. Again, when we say that the purely actual being thinks or knows things, we are using those terms analogically, not univocally. We can also say that the purely actual being has will. Consider again that the purely actual being is the cause of everything other than itself, meaning that the purely actual being must be uncaused in every respect. Hence, nothing is causing the purely actual being to create the universe, or indeed to actualize any potential whatsoever. But this, of course, would mean that the purely actual being cannot be compelled by anything external to it, since to be compelled is just a type of cause. To not be compelled to do something, however, is exactly what it means to do it freely. To act freely, furthermore, requires a will, so the purely actual being has a will. In fact, the purely actual being's will is the most free of them all, since it is absolutely unconstrained by anything else, which is something that even the most ardent defenders of free will cannot say of humans. Once again, you have to understand that when we say the purely actual being has a will, we are using the term analogously. For example, when we use our will to make choices, it takes time and often involves change in us. But this cannot be true of the purely actual being, which cannot change, and in fact makes all of its choices in a single act. However, there is still the fact that it is not constrained or compelled to do anything, which is what is most essential to having will. Finally, we can say that the purely actual being is all good. To do this, we need to understand how philosophers have traditionally described goodness and badness. Goodness involves actuality of some sort, whereas badness involves a lack of actuality, a potential that needs to be actualized but isn't. For example, consider a drawing of a square. There are several potentials that need to be actualized in order to consider it a square. First, it has to be a closed figure. Second, it has to have four straight sides. Third, all of its sides have to be congruent. Fourth, all of its interior angles have to be exactly 90 degrees. We call a square good to the extent that these potentials are actualized, and bad to the extent that these potentials are not actualized. Likewise, in a good piano player, certain potentials, such as hand independence, are actualized, whereas in a bad piano player, some of those potentials are not actualized. To use some more technical language, there is a privation in the piano player's abilities. We can also describe moral goodness and moral badness in terms of privation, for there are certain potentials that need to be actualized in order for human beings to flourish as a society. To the extent that human actions actualize these potentials, we call those actions morally good, and to the extent that human actions hinder these potentials from being actualized, we call them morally bad. Notice that to call something bad in any sense is to say that there is some potential that is not actualized. However, we cannot say that of the purely actual being, which has no potentials whatsoever. Thus, the purely actual being must be all good.
A corollary to the purely actual being's goodness is that it is all-loving. To love is to will what is good for something else. But if the purely actual being is all good, then its will must be all good, which means that it must will what is good for the things that it causes to exist. Hence, the purely actual being is all loving. Many, many atheists object to the notion that the purely actual being is all loving. For, so they say, if the purely actual being did will what is good for all things, then there would be no evil in the world. But since there clearly is evil in the world, there cannot be a being that is all-powerful and all-loving. This is the famous problem of evil. More specifically, this is the logical problem of evil, which argues that the existence of evil is logically inconsistent with an all-loving, all-powerful being. The response to this is simply to say that the purely actual being, because it is also omniscient, has perfectly good reasons for tolerating the existence of evil in the world, namely so that greater goods can come from it. For example, during World War II, the Allied powers often had to choose not to intervene with German military attacks they knew were coming. Why? Because if they had stopped every military attack, the German military would have known that their Enigma code had been decoded and would have stopped using it. The Allied powers had to tolerate the evils of the German military so that the Allied powers could ultimately defeat the German military. This is similar to how the purely actual being tolerates the existence of evil with the ultimate goal of defeating all evil. Note that this is not to say that the ends justify the means. We are not saying that the means are good because the ends are good. The evil in this world is no less evil because greater good can come from it. Also, we are not saying that the purely actual being actively wills the existence of evil, only that it tolerates the existence of evil. To use the logical problem of evil, therefore, one must show that there can be no possible justifiable reason for the purely actual being to tolerate certain evils. Many atheist philosophers have recently conceded that this cannot be done, which is why most of them instead use what is called the evidential problem of evil, which is a probabilistic argument. The evidential problem of evil states that there are evils in this world that seem so pointless it is highly unlikely that an all-good, all-powerful being exists. The response to this argument is to say that we have independent reasons and a deductive argument that shows that such a being must exist. Even though it may seem unlikely that the purely actual being could have a good reason for tolerating some of the evils in this world, we can know that it must have good reasons, because we know that it exists and is all-good and all-loving. Others have objected that the purely actual being's omnibenevolence conflicts with its free will. For if the purely actual being is all good, it must create the best possible world, which means that its choice to create was not, in fact, free. However, there are several problems with this objection. For one thing, the purely actual being could have chosen not to create any possible world at all, and would be no less good if it had done so. Also, this objection assumes that there can only be one best possible world, when that does not have to be the case. It is possible that there could be two, three, ten, five hundred, or even an infinite number of possible worlds that are all equally good with respect to each other, but are better than any other possible world outside of this set. So the purely actual being was then free to choose between any of these possible worlds or not to create at all. Also, even if we could somehow determine simply from knowing the purely actual being's nature that it must have created this world and not any other possible worlds, that action would still be free, at least in a compatibilist sense, because it would not have been compelled to do so by anything external to it. So this objection falls flat. So let's do one final recap. In the last video, we argued that a purely actual being must exist. In this video, we have shown that this purely actual being is one, the ultimate cause of everything other than itself, omnipotent, immutable, necessary, eternal, spaceless, timeless, immaterial, absolutely simple, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. But this is just what it means to say that God exists. So, God exists. QED. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, check out my sources in the description, and if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. I'll see you all in the next video.